more than 2,000 years, they were among the greatest mysteries of the ancient world. A forgotten king in quest of immortality and deification. A pantheon of gods worshipped and feared by civilizations. Colossal statues unlike any the world had ever seen. A mountain rivaling the most spectacular monuments ever built. A secret that could no longer be kept. Late 19th century, the sudden wealth of widespread industrialization and increasing curiosity in distant lands announced the dawn of a new era. Archaeology had become the new world sensation. Historians could enjoy the pride of unearthing lost civilizations, while their rich sponsors could prosper in the treasures. With their finds, the Germans and the British led the way in world archaeology. By 1881, Karl Hummer had discovered the Pergamum Temple. Heinrich Schliemann had been digging at Troy for 11 years, and Howard Carter was 41 years away from discovering the tomb of Tutankhamun. That same year, the Prussian Academy of Sciences in Berlin received a mysterious letter from the German consul in Izmir, a port city located at the western coast of the Ottoman Empire, now Republic of Turkey. Karl Sester, a German railroad engineer, claimed to have discovered a number of colossal statues on a mountain summit in eastern Turkey. There was more. Sester insisted that the mountain was more than 7,700 feet above sea level, and the statues were Assyrian, the prized ancient culture of the day. The members of the academy were puzzled. Although others before had surveyed the region, this was the first mention of Assyrian statues located on the summit of a mountain called Nemrud. The Academy quickly commissioned Otto Pushstein, one of their brightest, to meet Karl Sester in Cairo and set out on an expedition deep into uncharted Anatolia. Landing on the southern coast of modern-day Turkey, the travelers started their route through one of the most difficult paths in the world. They traveled through the rugged mountains and terrain of the country and up the legendary river Euphrates, the natural border between the ancient east and west. On April 30th, 1882, they were at Adiyaman, the destination city of the trip. After climbing up perilous cliffs and endless gorges, the explorers reached the summit on May 4, 1882, two months after their departure. What I first beheld was entirely surprising. The burial ground peak stretched upward over the highest point of the rock face, actually 40 meters higher than the terrace up to which we had climbed as if it were a mountain sitting on top of another mountain. On a high podium-like structure were five immense statues of seated figures carved out of the rock with their backs turned towards the burial peak, out of Pushstein. Whose portrayals were these colossal statues? The heads on the ground were more than six feet tall while the torso seemed to be higher than 30 feet. As he surveyed the site, Pushstein noticed that one of the figures had a club in his left hand. Could this be a portrayal of the Greek god Heracles? He decided to take a closer look. As Pushstein walked behind the statues, he noticed traces of a Greek inscription, which was possibly continuing down the other figures as well. 
In amazement, he quickly cleared the rocks. As Greek letters were revealed one after another, Pushtai was completely unprepared, for he was about to have the surprise of a lifetime. As you see, I have set up these divine images of Zeus, or Amazdes, and of Apollo, Mithras, Helios, Hermes, and of Atagnes, Heracles, Ares, and also of my nourishing homeland, Komageni. And from one and the same quarry, throned likewise among the deities who hear our prayers, I have consecrated the features of my own form. The inscription was addressing Pushtine personally. Who had composed this eloquent text and placed himself among the gods, which seemed to have Greek as well as Persian names? However, one question was answered. The monuments were not Assyrian. Pushtine felt that the answer laid once again in the text. But time and weather had taken their toll. The first lines containing the identity of the author were illegible. As he paced around, trying to solve the mystery, Pushtai noticed a way leading to another terrace behind the tumulus. When Pushtain came around the tumulus to the west terrace, he was both surprised and delighted to find that the sculptural and architectural features on the west terrace duplicated those of the east terrace. We find here the same sculptures and the same inscriptions. And for Pushtain, it was the inscriptions that were the most important. This allowed him to fill in gaps in the inscription that were missing on the East Terrace with those of the West Terrace. Pacing the text with the inscriptions on both terraces, Pushtain now had another clue. All of the father gods of Persia, Macedonia, and our own country, Komagene, will continue to bless their children and their grandchildren. The author was most likely a king of the little-known kingdom of Komagene, who claimed to be a descendant of both the Macedonians and the Persians. But which king was it? That same night, his frustration growing, Pushtai was finally able to decipher the necessary lines. The great king Antiochus, the god, the Righteous One, the Manifest, the friend of the Romans and the Greeks, the son of King Mithridates Callinicus, and of Laodice, the brother-loving goddess, has recorded for all time, on consecrated pedestals with inviolable letters, the deeds of his clemency. This inscription that Pushtain deciphered in 1882 at Mount Namrut is one of the most important discoveries of the Hellenistic world. This epic edict, 237 lines in all, gives us the history along with the structural details of this magnificent royal monument. Many of the unknowns were brought to light thanks to this inscription. Once he discovered the identity of the king, Pushtain could now concentrate on the site itself. The figures were unlike anything he had seen. They seemed to be neither Greek nor Persian, but a synthesis of the two worlds. As impressive as the statues and reliefs was the overwhelming 150-foot-high tumulus with millions of piled-up loose limestones. Overlooking the wide landscape, it towered over the two terraces, Pushtain immediately realized that this was the highest tumulus in the known world. The significance of their discovery was well beyond anyone's expectations. One of the important aspects about the discovery and study of Nimrodog and its sculpture and its architecture and its inscriptions was that it filled in a great gap in the history of the region. We know a lot about the Persian Empire to the east and the south and a lot about the Greeks and the encroaching Roman empires and a lot about Armenia. But we didn't know much about the region of Komagene, or the region on this side of the Euphrates River. Nothing of this size had ever been discovered till that day. 
eserler arasında. There was no other monument comparable in size from the Hellenistic period, which displayed Eastern and Western. In this case, Greek and Persian influences so distinctly. Ondan sonra bu yükseklikte Also there is no other monument built at such an elevation at 7700 feet above sea level. hiç bilinmeyen bir sözcükle tanımlanıyor bu. Lastly we find a new word unknown to scholars till Nemrut's discovery. Hierotezion ve ilk kez bu anlamına geliyor. Hierotezion yani kutsal mezar anlamına geliyor. As Pushtai rapidly prepared for his return journey, he once again turned to the inscription, and Tychus presented him a parting gift. I have taken forethought to lay the foundation of this sacred tomb, which is to be indestructible by the ravages of time, in closest proximity to the heavenly throne, wherein the fortunately preserved outer form of my person will rest through immeasurable time. The king was most likely buried in a tomb chamber located beneath the tumulus. If found, this would be the one and only unplundered burial chamber in the Hellenistic world. What started out to be a modest expeditionary trip had become one of the greatest archaeological discoveries of its time. Back in Germany, Pushstein's report was received enthusiastically by the Academy. They quickly authorized a second expedition in 1883, this time to be led by the more experienced Karl Humann. The same year, Osman Hamdi Bey, the curator of the Imperial Ottoman Museum in Istanbul, organized his own expedition. Suddenly, the 2,000-year-old site was receiving interest both from the East and the West. The Human Pushtain expedition, with their larger and more experienced crew, was able to study the site in more detail. They discovered more than 70 ancestral reliefs of Persian and Macedonian Greek dignitaries that represented the genealogy of Antiochus. The expedition was also able to give more attention to the very unique statues. They pinpointed that the headgear and tiaras were Persian and Armenian, while their sculptural style was Greek. Still unknown was the reason why Antiochus had ordered the construction of such a grand sanctuary. 7,700 feet above sea level, surrounded by nothing but mountains and the river Euphrates, containing colossal statues and ancestral reliefs, this had to be more than a simple burial shrine. Unfortunately, cloudbursts, strong winds, unbearable heat during the day, and freezing temperatures at night prevented any further analysis. The answers were left to future digs. The jumbled condition of the site and the overturned nature of all the sculptures made it that much more difficult for them to understand what they were seeing. They could not imagine the scale of the site. They could not read many of the inscriptions. They could not read many of the sculptures. They had to begin to slowly turn them over before they were finally overwhelmed with the wonderful discovery that they had made. Surprisingly, despite all their discoveries, Human and Pushtain, as well as Osman Hamdi Bey from Istanbul, described the site as nothing more than an impressive local product. Consequently, the archaeological world perceived the site only as the pompous self-gratification of an egotistical king. Hence, the awakening after 2,000 years was once again transformed into a state of dormancy. That is, until a woman from New York City decided that there was still much more to be said on Mount Nemrud. <music> Teresa Goel, educated in archaeology and architecture, was working at a dig in eastern Turkey in 1946. Having read Pushtain and Human's book, 
she decided to take a short trip to Mount Nemrud in 1947. A good student of classical history and art, Goel was convinced that the mountain held answers to one of the most puzzling mysteries of history. What had happened to the Hittites when they suddenly disappeared from the annals of history in the 8th century BC? Despite warnings by the locals on the dangers of a woman climbing to Mount Nemrud alone, she would not be deterred. In July of 1947, Teresa Goel was on top of Mount Nemrud. When I first saw Mount Nimrud and the sanctuary of Antiochus on it, I was overwhelmed with its sight and grandeur. I decided this would be a life's work. And life's work it became. In 1953, at the age of 52, with funding from the American School of Oriental Research and her hearing rapidly deteriorating, Teresa Goel became the first female archaeologist to lead a dig in eastern Turkey. Teresa Guell was about in her mid-50s in those days, a very unique, outspoken, friendly character, much loved by the local population, which I re immediately realized they all adored her. She was just one of those wonderful exploring women like Friar Stark and Lady Esther Stanhope, the first non-local woman, so to say, to come up to Mount Damrood. This, is, this will always be uh, connected with her pers personality, with her many-sided personality. Theresa Goel's collaborator was Friedrich Karl Dürner, a renowned German epigrapher and archaeologist. Two years prior to their partnership, he had discovered the royal tomb sanctuary of Antiochus's father, Mithridates Callinicus, at Arsimea on the Nymphaios. Professor Donner has the permission to work here, and Theresa Girl the permission for the Nemrut Dar. And they made a joint venture, and I think this was the best idea, idea they would have had, because Theresa Girl was an architect, Professor Donner was an uh, epigrapher and ancient historian. So she helped him here in architectural things. Professor Donner helped Teresa Girl at the top of the Nemrut Mountain in epigraphy. The team wasted no time in obtaining results. One of the first finds was a depiction of Antiochus's head buried under the limestone rubble in the eastern terrace. This was followed by reliefs of Antiochus being greeted by the gods on the western terrace. In the meantime, Dorna kept busy piecing together and deciphering the different Greek inscriptions. Most often, cataloging and restoration of the fragments were very laborious, made all the more difficult by the harmful effects of 2,000 years of abrasion and not so pleasant working conditions. From daytime highs of 130 degrees Fahrenheit, the temperature on the mountain plummeted to freezing at night. Fetching a bucket of water from the closest spring required a three-hour round trip. There was not a single tree for shade, lumber, or fuel. On the unsheltered heights, we were at the mercy of wind, rain, hail, and dust storms. Roving bears added a final touch. Teresa Goel. Coming to think of life in the mid-50s, up here on the mountain, brings back pleasant memories as well as dramatic reminiscences. Even in midsummer, you could experience dramatic changes of weather, clouds drawing up within a very short time, and a hailstorm which we could only survive by clinging to the tent poles and hold on to everything. But nevertheless, a lot of things got blown around and which was always kind of a disaster after the storm. Despite the adverse conditions, Goel and Dorna proceeded tenaciously to compile as much information as they could on the mountain. They were now able to construct a very accurate plan of the site. A closer examination of both the sanctuary on Nemrud and Arsimea on the Nymphaios revealed many common aspects, such as the double platform, 
stepped circles, dexiosis reliefs, and the two longest Greek inscriptions in Asia Minor. The Nimrud Sanctuary, with its hybrid statues of Hellenistic, Persian, and Hittite influences, was a more embellished form of the earlier Arsimea Sanctuary. It was evident that the site of Antiochus was rooted in tradition and syncretism. Clearly he's blending Persian, Iranian, Macedonian and Greek traditions in the art uh, and in the monumental sculpture. But in addition, he's, he's forging something new. Uh, he clearly uh, believes that he's forging a new Comagenian identity. Among all the relics, one took center stage. A lion relief excavated on the western terrace was constructed in the realistic Greek tradition but the head and mane clearly displayed Hittite influences. Moreover, on its back were three planets, 19 constellations, and a crescent moon. The inscription on the lion identified the three planets as Jupiter, Mercury, and Mars, all of them surprisingly being represented by the god statues in the sanctuary. This is a horoscope depicting a particular date in time. It is the earliest known Greek calendrical horoscope, a unique feature in archaeological excavations. Putting all the information together, it gives us a date in the first century BC. Being one of the oldest horoscopes in the world, the lion relief merited further study. In 1955, analysis of the alignment of the constellations revealed the date to be July 7th, 62 BC. As to what it signifies, opinions vary till this day. The date of 62 BC could correspond to a number of events in Antiochus' life. We know that around that same date, he came to a peace treaty of sorts with the Romans. So this could signify the date at which Antiochus ascended to the throne or became a legitimate king in the eyes of the Romans. It could also represent equally given the length of time that we know that it took to build the Herothosian of Nimrodog, this could also represent the foundation stone of the site. One thing was certain, though. What was termed as nothing but an impressive local product in 1883 was becoming the quintessential monument of East and West syncretism, with also local Hittite influences in art, religion, and architecture. The great Hittite empire was, in part, living in the monuments of Mount Nimrud. After Teresa Goel had studied the site for a number of years, it became clear to her that the influences on Antiochus' design were, came from more than just the Persian Empire and the Greek world. There was a considerable amount of Hittite influence here at the site as well. And it demonstrated to her, and she tried to convince the rest of the world of the fact that perhaps the influences of the Hittite period that continued later into the Syro-Hittite Empire had not died out several hundred years before, but were always at work here in the area of Komogeni. The archaeological world now had a greater appreciation of the history and influences of Mount Nimrud. Every inch of the monument echoed the presence of its builder. With her ever-increasing knowledge of Mount Nimrud, Teresa Goel could imagine Antiochus gazing down on his kingdom as he dictated his sacred edict. I announced in the piety of my thought that the kingdom subject to my throne should be the common dwelling place of all the gods. In that, by means of every kind of art, I decorated the representations of their life form and the ancient lore of Persians and Greeks the fortunate roots of my ancestors. You have to wonder that what really drives a man to build on such a monumental scale. The autobiographical inscriptions, the scale of the monuments, the actual location of Nemrut Dar, all point to a man who uh, must have been uh, brimming over with self-confidence. Uh, we can even say that uh, you know, perhaps uh, Antiochus uh, was, was brimming with vanity. Uh, surely it was, it was something like vanity that, that, that allowed a man to build on such a monumental scale uh, on the highest point in this part of the Taurus uh, mountain region. 
due to the pioneering works of Teresa Goel and Dorner on Mount Nemru, Antiochus and the Comagena dynasty were ready to emerge from the mists of history. The River Euphrates, the natural link between the ancient East and West, for thousands of years, the setting for the grandest civilizations and the bloodiest conquests. To control the river was synonymous with dominating the routes to Persia, India, and Mesopotamia. The river Euphrates has always represented a life source for this country. It supplied the territory with water, which is essential for the agriculture, but it gave also other benefits. The crossing of the river gave to the city which controlled it, and consequently to the state which controlled it, the possibility to have good profits. The river was at the same time a boundary and the fundamental way of communication. The importance of this river is clear when we think of some inscription dedicated to a god Euphrates. Comagena was just one of many kingdoms founded on the shores of the majestic Euphrates. Kumahu, as the region was called in the 9th century BC, prospered under the rules of the Hittites and the Assyrians after them. The legacy of these two great civilizations abounds the area in ancient workshops and quarries. This region was a very prosperous land. The main income derived from its fertile soil, from its forests, especially cedar forests, and from the control of the west bank of the Euphrates, which actually meant the control of the traffic between Mesopotamia and Anatolia. By third century BC, Alexander the Great's dream of a world empire based on east-west synthesis had failed. His empire was swiftly divided among his ambitious generals. By second century BC, the Seleucid Empire, founded by and named after one of Alexander's lieutenants, was in terminal turmoil. Little principalities sought to break away and claim their independence. The small but fertile region of Comagene was among the rebels. Ptolemaeus, a local satrap, declared Comagene's independence in 163 BC. His son, Samos, solidified the kingdom he inherited from Ptolemaeus. Samos was quick to realize that with great reserves of iron mines, its position at the intersection of Hellenic and Persian worlds and control of the river Euphrates, Comagene's strategic importance was unmatched by its size. To unify his diverse people, Samos initiated a cultural syncretism between the Persian East and the Hellenic West. He also fortified his capital, Samosata, making it the most important crossing point of the river Euphrates. His achievements and legacy live in his 15-foot rock relief at Gargar, where he is supposedly buried. In early 1st century BC, with the rising threat of the Parthians and the Armenians, small kingdoms faced annihilation or annexation. In this political climate, Samos arranged a marriage between his son, Mithridates Kalenikos, and a Seleucid princess named Laodike. With this union, Comagene joined the royal house of the Seleucids, as well as the Egyptians. The marriage also produced a son, they named him Antiochus. A very good example of the diplomatic strategy of these Comagenian kings is the case of Samos. Uh, Samos married his son Mithridates to uh, Laodice, the daughter of Antiochus VIII of, uh, of Syria. Um, and through this alliance, he brought the prestige of the Seleucid house, uh, which of course uh, stretched far back into the fourth century to the, to the days of Alexander the Great, uh, this prestige was now lent to the Comagenian kings. Unfortunately, prestige was not enough for survival among the giants. 
the threat of the Parthians and the Armenians was magnified by the eastward advance of the Roman military juggernaut. Lands were changing hands as fast as day turned into night. With its strategic crossings at the Euphrates, Comagena was about to face a new and formidable enemy in the form of Tigranes the Great of Armenia. In the first century BC, when the Seleucid Kingdom had, uh, had shrunk considerably, uh, this presented an opportunity for powerful local kings to expand their power. Tigranes of Armenia uh, expanded his own power southwards and incorporated the kingdom of Comagene uh, into his own realm. Uh, Comagene then formed, if you like, a satellite of Armenia for approximately 17 years, down to about 70 or 69 BC. Around 70 BC, amidst all this turmoil, a coronation on the skirts of Mount Nimrud marked the beginning of a new era, both for Comagene and Asia Minor. Antiochus, the son of Mithridates Callinicus and Laodice, ascended to the throne of Comagene under the proud approval of his diverse people. With many external problems awaiting him, the young king was determined to protect and elevate his kingdom to among the greats of his time. Antiochus is the most well-known king of Comagene. He claimed to be the descendant of Darius I of Persia and Alexander the Great of Macedonia. He was the founder of a religious and cultural project in order to create a cult for himself, for his father, and for some deities which were born from a syncretism between an Iranian pantheon and the Greek pantheon. In 69 BC, Tigranes the Great was defeated by Lucullus, but the double threat of the Romans and the Parthians remained. The Parthians coveted Comagene as a gateway to the west, while the Romans desired it as a stepping stone to the Near East. During the Roman triumvir Pompey's march to the east, Antiochus managed to secure Rome's trust and was awarded the city of Zeugma on the Euphrates in 62 BC. This date changed his life, we can say, because without that money he earned from the trade routes in Zeugma, Antiochus of Comagene would never have been able to create places like Nemrudar and Asameya on the Nymphias with such fantastic figures and statues and great inscriptions. Referring to himself as fellow Romain, lover of Rome, Antiochus had managed to extend the borders of his kingdom without any bloodshed. But he knew that for long-term survival, he had to balance the Roman alliance with the Parthian one as well. In 40 BC, Antiochus gave his daughter Laodicus as a wife to a Parthian prince, Orodes II. This is because uh, dynastic marriages provided always a means of consolidation. With this marriage, Antiochus tried to steer cautiously between two powers, the Romans and the Parthians. A cautious statesman playing a delicate game of international politics, Antiochus enjoyed a period of calm and prosperity between 62 and 36 BC. He initiated a cultural and religious program that would lead to monuments, which in time would become synonymous with absolute grandeur. After Antiochus ascends to the throne, he initiates a countrywide cult reform. He begins the practice of a religion centered on himself, and in time he begins to portray himself to his people more as a god than a king. Maybe he thought that he's really a god, we don't know. But on the other side, we must always see that the deification of the ruler is part of the internal policy. 
He needs it for internal policy to bring all the groups in Komagene together. There have been different groups from Greek, from Persia, from somewhere else, and he wanted to form a unity of Komagene. The first impressive testament to Antiochus's new cult, the common dwelling place of his diverse people, was to be the tomb sanctuary of his father at Arsimea on the Nymphaios. I was determined to hand over this country to my successors by honoring the gods. And I had the ambition of developing this city and building a hero Tision. I recreated anything that had been built, reinforcing and redecorating it. He thought that oversized, great buildings would be just the right things to show his godness. He made sure that all over his kingdom, the people can easily follow and join his cult and pray together with him. So he distributed in the whole country the leaves like that behind me. However, the period of peace was interrupted when Pacorus, the Parthian heir apparent and the son of Antiochus' son-in-law, crossed the Euphrates and invaded Roman territory. Torn between his two alliances, Antiochus sided with his son-in-law and helped the Parthians. The Romans were furious. Triumvir Mark Anthony seized the opportunity to show Rome's might to all the little principalities in Asia Minor. He immediately ordered his troops to seize the Comagenian capital, Samosata. Suddenly, Antiochus and his little kingdom were up against the most powerful empire in the world. Commanding the world's greatest military, Mark Anthony's generals were convinced that the victory would be swift and decisive. Retreating to the well-protected Samosata fortress, Antiochus and his skilled archers were ready to make their stand against the Romans. As Mark Anthony's troops attacked, the Comagenians showered the Romans with their arrows. Unexpecting such a formidable defense, the Romans were taken by total surprise. Antiochus had managed to stop the Roman attack. Mark Anthony was forced to sign an agreement and withdraw his forces. A humiliating embarrassment of the Romans was the greatest victory of Antiochus. The success that Antiochus had in withstanding the siege of Samosata uh, undoubtedly uh, uh, raised his own profile within his uh, subject population. Um, it must have been an enormous boost to him, uh, particularly since he was such a, uh, a militarily much weaker power than the Romans or the Parthians. So this, this must have given an enormous uh, boost of morale uh, and prestige to Antiochus himself. With his prestige consolidated, Antiochus could now finish his life's project. His tomb sanctuary would be a testament to his success, as well as a pilgrimage site for all his people. Here, they would honor him and the gods for all eternity. The establishment of the ruler cult here on Nimrodug, and his placement of himself amongst the gods while he was alive, and the prescription that he had all the inhabitants come up and worship him twice a year, once in July and once in December, were probably done to ensure his place in history. This was to ensure that not only he was immortal amongst the gods, but also immortal amongst not only the equivalent kings of the time, but also immortal amongst his townspeople. To ensure his immortality, 
Antiochus presided over one of the greatest and most difficult building projects in human history. It was a very difficult location. Lives might have even been lost while he was building the site. There is no water anywhere near the site. The closest water source is over an hour's walk or an over an hour mule ride down the mountain. There is no evidence of any camp up on the site for where the workers might have lived while they were building the site. It's very hot. It's windy on the site. There is a lot of hardship that Antiochus and his crew must have endured in order to build a site of this magnificence. Mount Nemrud remained to be Antiochus' most prominent project for the rest of his life. He spent his remaining years embellishing the tomb sanctuary and propagating his cult. The details of Antiochus' death uh, are equally shrouded in mystery. We know also that by 32 BC, a new king was on the Comagenian throne. This is Mithridates, who was clearly Antiochus' son. So at some point between 38 and 32, Antiochus seems to have died. It's possible that he was assassinated. It's equally possible uh, that he uh, died peacefully uh, in his bed. Antiochus's son, Mithridates II, added monuments of his own at Karakush, where his mother and sister were buried, and Sasonk, his own burial sanctuary. These were the last additions of the cult chambers initiated and glorified by Antiochus. The Comagenian dynasty lived for another century after Antiochus, but under the suspicious eyes of the Romans, his successors had little time to propagate his cult and administer his edict. Finally, in 72 AD, Roman Emperor Vespasian annexed Comagene as part of Syria and changed its name to Euphratasia. The kingdom of Comagene had endured for 230 years. The glorious reign of Antiochus is long gone. More than a hundred years after its discovery, Mount Nemrud is still woven with secrets. The eternal gazes of the gods are the only witnesses to the enigma, as scholars still try to solve the mountain's mysteries. The works of Teresa Goel and Carl Dorner and recent studies have brought new finds to light. Some historians insist that the cult center was never completed and the magnificent rituals Antiochus had envisioned were never realized by his followers. We know for sure that the reliefs on the northern terrace were never completed. Also, if we take a look at the Antiochus head on the eastern terrace, it will be obvious that it was never completed also. All the details of the Antiochus head on the western terrace, such as the ears, the nose, and the mouth, were completed. But none of these details can be seen on the one on the eastern terrace. It's very rough. When we add all these indications together, we can say that the hero Tizion, Mount Nemrut, was never completed. The greatest mystery centers once again on Antiochus. Was he really buried beneath the massive man-constructed limestone hill? Or was he buried by his father's side at Arsimea on the Nymphios, or along with his ancestors at Gargar? What became of his tomb chamber? The answers have eluded archaeologists since Pushtine and Teresa Goel. Both archaeologists and tomb robbers have been searching for Antiochus' tomb for over 100 years. And probably the primary reason for that is that if it were ever discovered, it would probably be one of the only, the only undisturbed Hellenistic tomb of a ruler ever found. 
and that would place its importance up there with King Tut as one of the great finds in archaeology. Teresa Goel attempted to dig for the tomb on Nemrud numerous times between 1954 and 1961, while Derna searched for the burial chamber at Arsamea on the Nymphaios. But, lacking modern-day equipment and precise instruments, these attempts yielded nothing but damage to the exterior of the tumulus and the statues. Where Antiochus was buried is probably uncertain. Uh, he is probably not buried here. There is no evidence that he was buried here. Teresa Goel's excavation spent many years probing into the mound to find out whether he was buried here. All of them were unsuccessful. She sunk uh, several tunnels into the mound at the base of the mound behind the statues to try to find the chamber, and no entry chamber was found. In 1989, Dr. Senja Shaheen, the director of the most recent excavations, and his team conducted geophysical tests around the mound in an attempt to pinpoint the burial chamber. The tests have yielded three anomalies within the tumulus. The researchers believe that the cavities lay on a so-called Zeus axis, located behind the two Zeus statues on both terraces. Batı terasında during our geophysical testing in 1989, we pinpointed a cavity in the mound, 45 feet below the western terrace. There is another cavity close to the peak. It is probable that the cavity near the summit might be the tomb chamber of Antiochus, while the cavity below that one is some sort of a drainage room collecting the rain and the melted snow. The exact nature of these crevices is yet to be determined with more advanced testing. As Mount Nimrod awaits further probing, Antiochus continues to puzzle scholars. Unfortunately, the harmful hands of nature and man have destroyed most of the clues that could have helped solve the mysteries. Gone are more than 70 ancestral reliefs that used to decorate both terraces. Facial features of the lion horoscope and crucial parts of the inscriptions behind the statues. There has been substantial damage to the site already over the years with tomb robbers and archeologists looking for the tomb of Antiochus. And if any further excavation were done on the site to look for Antiochus's tomb chamber, the tumulus and the rest of the site of Nemerdog would be irreparably damaged beyond repair because the tumulus is already sliding down. In order to find the tomb chamber, if there is a tomb chamber inside, one would have to excavate into the tumulus, and it is very unstable. And the only way to excavate it would be to destroy it. There is nothing in the world comparable. You find statues, you find tumuli, you find pyramids, but you do not find huge, oversized, gigantic colossal statues in a mountainous area in conjunction with the tumulus. Let us think of the monument as a gift from the past which we should try to keep, maintain and preserve as well as possible. Look at the proper maintenance of the statues, leave the tumulus alone, try to restore as much as uh, can be done without enforcing any ideas which are probably not to be correlated with the reality. Antiochus himself warned ancient and modern day trespassers scheming to desecrate his sacred burial ground. If he in his folly of mind, undertakes measures contrary to the honor of the gods and attempts to ravage this hero Tision. May he, even without my curse, suffer the full wrath of the gods. The quest for Antiochus's grave continues, as well as the controversy surrounding it. Scholars believe that if the burial chamber is ever found, it will be the greatest archaeological discovery since the opening of Tutankhamun's tomb in Egypt. But for now, Antiochus and his gods guard the secrets of Mount Nemrud as they have done so for the past 2,000 years.